those on the side of the room please settle down yeah. <laughs> isabel varuna can you guys settle down Do this after. Do this after. We're ready to begin our next panel on um, surveillance capitalism. This panel is called uh, "How Personal Is Your Data?" We have with us uh, uh, Ms. Kathleen Berger from uh, the Mozilla Foundation, Ephraim Percy Kenyanito from Article 19, Sean Kanak with the National Institute of Strategic Studies, and uh, Mr. Fouad Mohi with the Ministry of Justice in Morocco. Dr. Samir Saran will be chairing. Dr. Saran, over to you. Thank you, Beda. Can I request you all to settle down? and i hope i can be heard in the room i'm going to be a little loud so that i can get your attention there are many conversations happening here uh, and i want this to be the only conversation in the room now for the next one hour thank you um, i'm delighted to uh, welcome my panelists this morning who will be discussing how personal is your data surveillance capitalism democracy and politics in the 21st century i have changed the title right now because i don't only want it to be about democracy i want it to be about how political regimes are under threat across the world irrespective of their nature and i think let's broaden the debate and bring all countries in irrespective of their own form of uh, regimes now uh, i'll be joined by my panelists on the right is kathleen berger global engagement lead with mozilla um, she was uh, on the dark side until a few years ago she worked for the german government uh, uh, we have uh, uh, next to her sean kanuk director of cyberspace and future conflict international institute of strategic studies he was in doing a good job until a few years back he was with the intelligence community in the us uh, next to him we have ifraim persi kananito the digital program officer article 19 in eastern africa who is determined to change the uh, data conversations on this continent and finally we have fuad mohi uh, who is going to join us from morocco he's a director of human resources in the ministry of justice um, he will be speaking in french Uh, so those who will require translation you have your translators with you we are uh, it's a trilingual conference english spanish french please uh, choose your language and your preferences available uh, on your devices um, we are not going to be uh, go we are not going to have lengthy presentations we are going to have a discussion format uh, let me start with uh, sean kanuk and let me be upfront i would like uh, the debates in this conference to be direct frank sometimes um, uh, passionate uh, sometimes uh, 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 very brutal but always kind and gentle so uh, ask the tough questions but do so kindly and nicely so shall let me ask you the questions the united states has shown over the last 3 to 4 years that the state itself manipulates and scavenges for data and uses it for perverse purposes recently it has shown that its companies and corporations also prey on people's data and use it for um, different purposes so coming from the country which has seen both the state and the private sector 
manipulate personal data and in fact invade personal freedoms. Are you of the opinion that there is no personal data anymore and privacy is dead? Well, thank you, Samir. Uh, first, let me also thank our Moroccan hosts and Sci-Fi for inviting me to participate. Uh, and I think you've tackled a lot in that very first question, but let me do my best. Uh, certainly, surveillance and data collection by both government entities and private sector companies is a huge issue, and especially from the U.S. perspective and experience. Uh, to start, I'd like to make one distinction between the collection of data and the manipulation of data. You use the word manipulate, and that is an extreme concern, but it is actually yet another concern beyond collection itself, and it's something I hope we talk about further together. But on the pure surveillance side, we have seen our government collecting specific content of communications in regard to subjects of interest in a number of capacities, and we've seen collection of metadata, this bulk collection to detect patterns to help identify issues. On the private sector, we've seen companies, the big search engines, the large social media companies, collecting huge troves of data through very permissive user agreements. And we've seen breaches of that trust recently, Facebook and elsewhere. The real question I think that you got to of, what does this mean for privacy? And when I think about it, especially for this audience, let me say what it's not. I don't think it's about government being big brother. I think it's private sector driven because even when government wants your information, they're often relying on private sector technologies. Secondly, I don't think it's just about your government or your country or companies in your country. Increasingly, individuals and interests from Africa, Middle East, India are realizing, and Europe as well, are realizing they're dealing with companies that are outside their own jurisdiction. So how do they grapple with this issue? Third, it's not necessarily the primary interest of the users themselves. I see individuals freely giving this data to companies in return for applications and functionality. And last, possibly most problematic, in a world of big data as we go to the Internet of Things, I sincerely don't think it's possible. What do I not think is possible anymore? Keeping secrets for any lengthy period of time, simply look at governments and national security organizations, they can't even keep their secrets private. Large companies and banks can't keep their data private without occasional breaches. So I return to the issue of what does privacy mean today? And we already mentioned the youth of our nations in the opening statements. I question if the coming generations desire privacy the way people of my age or older did in the past, and if they are willing to forego functionality to have privacy. I'm going to answer that last question is I don't think they are, which means perhaps the surveillance concern approach is framing the question the wrong way. I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing comments from others and delving into this deeper. But for me, I think the era of secrecy and privacy is almost a 20th century conversation. I am tempted to uh, jump and uh, jump to Kathleen right away and ask her this question. Are the youth today not interested in privacy? And is this a 20th century notion? Is it just old people talking about something that is alien now? Personal space, privacy, data integrity. Uh, what do you have to say to Sean's assertion? Thank you. Um, also, thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving me the chance to reply immediately because I would actually, I was sitting here like, no, 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 no. I very much disagree with that. Um, privacy is definitely not dead. Um, and I'm like, I mean, I'm German, I'm European, there, and I work for Mozilla. There are multiple reasons of why I would disagree with that. Um, I think that privacy is is not just something that happens in the data economy, it's much broader than that. And it's this area, this space in ourselves where we are truly free. And uh, we, we lose our agency as individuals if we don't have a space where we can just be ourselves unmonitored. And that is broader than just being in the digital society. There are a lot of interferences and a lot of threats to our right to privacy, but it is for a reason protected by the UN Declaration on Human Rights and by other international treaties because it is so important. Um, and I, I disagree on, on another level, which is 
Um, as a European, come May 25th, um, the general data protection regulation is going to come into force, and I actually think that that is going to be a game changer and a historic moment because it's going to challenge the collect at all culture that many tech companies have these days. And especially when you say that most data collection interference in privacy is coming from the private sector, given that there's a 4% fine range for global turnovers for companies, that is quite significant. And finally, I think that data protection is getting teeth with that. And uh, um, the third reason, working for a Mozilla not-for-profit we were founded the same year as Google, and there are a lot of people who say you can't be innovative unless you are part of the data economy and collect all the data possible because you might just as well use it in the future. You never know. That's what innovation takes these days. Mozilla has been very privacy protecting from the beginning, and for us, GDPR is actually just a natural development of practices that we've developed over 20 years. We're still around, and we are an internet company, um, so I would largely and hugely challenged that there is no way to a collect only data that you really need to use servers and make them convenient and useful to your users and still make sure that they have choice because that's ultimately what you is it's yes it's natural to post yes it's natural to share and that's perfectly okay but the point is you need to choose so if i take a hundred selfie just to select one that i might want to post on instagram i actually don't have an instagram account but talking like theoretically then it's my choice which one I choose. And it's not for somebody else to decide that it needs to be public, that I've actually taken 100 to find the one that I like. Or I might choose not to share my first 10 minutes, uh, my first morning coffee or the 10 minutes that I stay extra in bed. The point is I need that choice and that shouldn't be undermined. Uh, Kathleen, let me um, ask you another question. So there are two a pre, you know, there are two conversations that take place around EU and innovation and data. The first is that if an idea comes out of Europe, it is generally a bad idea. Uh, if you want to have a, a, a sensible, uh, robust digital economy, uh, the data protection policies of Europe is not the path to follow. If you want access, growth, uh, and economic potential to be truly realized, we might tend to lean towards the US model. That's one school of thought. The second school of thought is that this is a false binary, that privacy and growth are both possible. And we are unnecessarily creating this schism, which does not necessarily uh, hold true if uh, you look at certain other models. Um, but the European uh, experience around creating these uh, unicorns and, and the big digital companies is quite poor. Now, how would you respond to these two sets of conversations that seek to describe Europe or, or the European approach to privacy and, and data integrity? Um, they're both true. Both schools definitely exist. Um, I think it's pretty clear that I'm more in the second school of thought. I don't think that privacy is an obstacle to innovation. In fact, I actually believe there's, there's one thing with the Silicon Valley approach to benefits fast, faster, faster. You just consider certain things later um, that, yes, Europe is slower, but maybe also a little more sustainable um, because, how do I put that? Um, I'm just trying to, to reflect on how to best say that. Um, so it's, it's, you know, you, you can either cater to short-term profit and everyone is happy, of course, if you make money. We all need to make money some way. But you can aim for, shoot for short-term benefits for yourself or you can think in the long term of what actually benefits everyone because even if you profit in the short term, you're still also a consumer and a citizen and so are your family and your friends and people closely around you. So just generating something that is valuable for yourself is probably not the long-term goal. And I think right now in the current age, and you mentioned that earlier, and you mentioned that also, that we are seeing a lot of distrust and a lot of desolation with how the digital economy has developed. And I think that it is this, and like, how do we actually gain that trust again? Because otherwise we will see people just disconnecting or giving up and actually engaging with innovation and not believing it anymore, means that we have to think in the long-term, sustainable benefit for everyone and I believe that if you had developed practices that are rights protecting by design, 
it's the right thing to do. And once we have, we also help raise awareness amongst consumers and citizens that they do have certain rights, that there are alternatives, that they have options and they do have choices and tell them what the choices are, the rest will nat follow naturally because they will also demand more ethically and responsibly designed products and services. Okay, so that sounds a bit like socialism to me. Uh, but but uh, nevertheless, it's an it's, 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 uh, 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 idea there. Uh, Percy, let me come to you. Sean, I'm going to come back to you because I think uh, you will have a lot to answer for. You have a lot to answer for. But, <laughs> no, but, but, but I'm going to come back to you. Uh, Percy, uh, you know, you've been in engaged in this conversation in East Africa. You've been working in an uh, organization that seeks to bring data protection as a central feature of African Union's approach to the digital sector. Um, and it seems to me that you are caught between uh, two models as well. Uh, of course, uh, there is a large part of the African conversation which is manipulated and funded by the European Union and the money that flows from there. Uh, and they want you to adopt their approaches. They come and have capacity building workshops. They have models and partnerships. And then the second one, you have a Chinese hardwiring the African continent. You have the Chinese telecom, Chinese infrastructure that comes in, builds their systems, uh, give their mobile operating systems on your Android phones. And that is a very different uh, conversation around privacy and, and, and data control. Uh, where is Africa placed in this conversation? And where is certainly your organization and your uh, own network um, uh, uh, placed on this? Okay, uh, my name is Ephraim Kenyanito. Uh, that title is not title, that's my boss's title. I am the program officer in charge of digital rights. Um, so don't, uh, I have not replaced my boss for those who know my boss. <laughs> yes, um, so um, about what is the African position? What is, what do Africans want? We did a research two years ago at Article 19. Uh, just to give a background, Article 19, we stem our uh, mandate from the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We've existed for the last 30 years across the world. We have presence in 11 countries working on freedom of expression and freedom of information. So at Eastern Africa office, we did a research uh, two years ago working with women journalists uh, and we found that 77% of some of those women that we, we worked with um, felt that their privacy had been infringed. And then out of that 77%, around 60% of out of that 77% withdrew or felt that they would withdraw from using online to uh, offline uh, once their privacy was infringed. So users themselves, uh, for example, you're a woman journalist, you're covering stories, and then uh, there's people uh, inf infringing on your privacy because of the stories that you're covering, maybe political stories, anti-corruption work, and, and that, um, informed or has informed some of the positions that we have right now. So it's not, we're not US or y Europe or China kind of focus. It's what the users want because there are various researches which have been done over the last several years and the users themselves feel that they want privacy, especially the young people. There's res this research that was done five years ago by Pew Center, which focused on young people, the youth, um, which I'm part of, uh, the young people. Uh, and the, the young people felt that they, they wanted the choice. Going back to what Kathleen was mentioned, that um, you need that choice. You need that, in, that choice of uh, whether to have your uh, data taken and what kind of data. Um, so that choice. And about China, China has invested 1.7 billion uh, in the se African sector. And ICT sector is the fifth largest investment that China has made uh, over the, since 2000. So this is research from 2000. And there's some challenges that we've faced. I'm sure some of you might be aware, and I'd be curious to hear more further on this. Uh, when Zambia Watchdog talked about Huawei technologies um, being installed on intermediaries. So going back to your conversation about intermediaries, Sean, that telcos are being mandated by governments or are cooperating with government under some very shadowy regimes to to uh, to install certain devices in their in, in in their networks. Or Ethiopia Human Rights Watch reports four years ago where Ethiotel, the only uh, telco uh, in in Ethiopia, um, 
cooperating with Z ZTE, uh, the Chinese company, and the kind of software and the kind of investments that was made. So looking at that and then the users' rights and what has happened, some, some users having to flee out of their countries to exile because of, uh, of some of these kind of, uh, of, 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 of technologies and what is happening to them and their families. So um, that's just what I'd emphasize and, and echo what Kathleen mentioned and say that um, in, in Africa, we yes, I know we don't have as much data protection laws. We only have um, 23 draft or enacted laws. And out of these 23, we only have nine data protection authorities. But we need to empower them. We need to empower ourselves to, to, to have these conversations further and to make people aware because privacy is not foreign to Africa. I'll give the example. Yes, um, the African um, Charter for Human Rights, uh, privacy is not explicitly mentioned, but under dignity, the right to dignity, it has been interpreted by various courts all over Africa to mean privacy. So privacy is an inherently African thing. It's not a European or a Chinese thing that you're trying to figure out as Africans. I think that's a valid observation. Privacy is also an organic concept in Africa, Sean. Um, and uh, let me ask you a question uh, before I move to Fouad, uh, because I think I want to get him on this point. You have complete disregard for what corporations and governments do with your data in the United States of America. And yet, you make such a large noise around Russia being able to influence, manipulate, use data, use profiles, uh, make it create fake news, and, um, uh, and challenge the political systems or the certain election that took place a couple of years ago. So why, is, why, why was America surprised? Why were the Americans so surprised and shocked? when uh, your open systems were manipulated by some other actor. And, and then the next question is that what does a country like the US do, which actually continues to collect data, which continues to profile people, and has actually created uh, perfect instruments for others to hijack and use? Coming from a democracy at one extreme of the free speech antipode, I would agree with you. I'm amazed at how surprised many of my fellow citizens were with the ability to manipulate these very open platforms. As a technologist and a strategist, that opportunity was aware to me. Anyone who knows that you can astroturf your Twitter account and buy followers, who knows that you can, even though you're not supposed to, register under multiple fake accounts and spread information, uh, it struck me quite curious at how surprised people were. That is one of the downsides of having a very open system of freedom of expression is it is manipulable, going back to the word you used in the beginning. And it ties to something that is very near and dear to my heart, the distinction between the political and practical side of privacy. And right now you may think that I disagree strongly with Kathleen or Mr. Kenyanito. In reality, I think we all harbor an interest for that privacy at the level of human dignity. What I'm talking about is the practical ability of you to manage your own privacy. While we may have legal protections, does that protect you from malfeasance by a bureaucrat who decides to monitor you? Does that protect you from prosecution or persecution of sectarian violence if the opposing party is in power? The legal protections themselves do not necessarily prevent those abuses. You need the practical protection. This is why when I see countries outlawing the use of virtual private networks or certain levels of encryption, that to me is the true challenge of privacy because it takes control over your privacy away from you and hands it to someone else, maybe the government, maybe a foreign tech company. I've sat down with large social media companies and asked them how they decide to deregister terrorist lists, terrorist websites or media accounts. I say, which standard do you use? Are you using the US State Department list of terrorists? Are you using the United Nations Security Council list of terrorists? Your reliance on another political entity. So turning it back to the question and looking at my own society, I think where the United States freedom and freedom of expression community is coming at is trying to create the technological or the practical guarantees of privacy in case 
legal and political guarantees are abused at certain points. Oh, I, I think that's a good point. But the problem is that you will create the technological guarantees for privacy for a few, those who can afford it. If you, if you make encryption and technology solutions as the precondition of personal dignity, then basically those uh, 5 million or 5 billion who cannot afford those solutions are left out of that particular uh, solution. And I recognize that as not only a challenge, but a collective need. That is why I'm so excited to work with sci-fi in India in here. That is why I want to engage audiences like this and say, don't rely purely on Silicon Valley and companies that follow American culture and American rules. Don't rely exclusively on Shenzhen or Chinese development and companies that, bre that uh, utilize the Chinese cultural and political model. Build your own capabilities that serve your own interests. And I think uh, getting the youth involved, getting venture capital involved, grassroots financing, to create these technologies in your own countries, in your own regions, to fulfill your own cultural standards. I think that's hugely important, and that's part of the reason I'm excited to be involved with something like sci-fi. Thank you. Let me turn to uh, Mr. Fuad. Um, yesterday, um, when we were having a conversation with um, some eminent uh, individuals uh, of um, the Moroccan society before this conference began, uh, we were told by a few that there is today a degree of discomfort over many of these big social media companies and uh, uh, how uh, certain conversations and certain behavioral patterns can uh, challenge, can undermine uh, the fabric of society in, in this region as well. Uh, sitting in Morocco, how do you react to what you've been hearing uh, in the U.S. around the Cambridge Analytica episode uh, and uh, uh, about the uh, whole question of external interference in domestic political debates. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Veuillez m'excuser, je vais parler en arabe. Je crois qu'il y a des... بالنسبة للمغرب والتجربة المغربية أظن أنني لست مؤهلا بشكل كبير للحديث في هذا الموضوع لأنني هنا أحضر معكم نيابة على سيد مدير دراسات التعاون والتحديث وهو المختص لكن ظروف العمل منعته من الحضور وجئت أمثل وزارة العدل وأمثله شخصيا بصفتي مديرا للموارد البشرية بوزارة العدل لكن هذا لن يمنعني من أن أتحدث في الموضوع وأن أحيطكم علما بكون المغرب قد صدق في 2009 على قانون يتعلق بحماية المعطيات الشخصية وهو القانون 2009-2008 بتاريخ 18 فبراير 2009 وقد جاء في المادة الأولى من هذا القانون الارتيكل 1 المادة الأولى تقول بأن المعلومات في خدمة المواطن وتتطور في إطار التعاون الدولي ويجب أن لا تمس بالهوية والحقوق والحريات الجماعية أو الفردية للإنسان وينبغي أن لا تكون أداة لإفشاء أسرار الحياة الخاصة للمواطنين فبالرجوع إلى هذا القانون نرى أن المغرب لم يترك المجال مفتوحا لمجموعة من التأويلات ولكن هذا القانون 
فيه مجموعة من المعطيات التي تساهم في تطوير العملية التكنولوجية والرقمنة وتبادل المعلومات ولكن في حدود معينة أما إذا أمكن وفي وقت لاحق فيمكنني أن أعطيكم تجربة وزارة العدل فيما يتعلق بالرقمنة وبتبادل المعلومات والمعطيات والمنصات الإلكترونية التي من خلالها يمكن للمواطن ويمكن للمحامي اللجوء والتقاضي أمام المحاكم المغربية والحصول على الأحكام مباشرة دون اللجوء إلى الفضاء إلى فضاء المحكمة شكرا مستر فؤاد let me ask you another question um, how easy is it for um, uh, governments such as those in Morocco and uh, other parts of this uh, continent to engage with many of these transnational corporations and big social media companies what is the relationship um, in case you need to engage with them to respond to certain situations. How easy or how difficult uh, is, this, uh, uh, is this partnership with big companies which your citizens use uh, in their daily conduct of their lives? طبعا فوزارة العدل في إطار البرامج وهي برامج واعدة جدا ولديها تصور 2018-2023 وقد تم التعاقد مع شركات دولية عالمية معروفة في هذا الإطار قصد تطوير قصد تطوير كل البرامج المعلوماتية وأن يكون هذا في خدمة المرفق والمرتفق وذلك في إطار التحول الرقمي الشامل الذي تعرفه الإدارة القضائية في إطار المشروع الكبير الذي يعرفه المغرب من أجل رقمنة الإدارة I'm going to turn it over to all of you now to um, ask questions to Sean, Kathleen, Percy, and uh, Fouad. Uh, let me, uh, while you muster up your hands and I can start seeing them, uh, uh, let me uh, ask Percy a question. Is it possible for the African Union to come up with a common position? Because that is a precondition for the success of this model in Europe, shared sovereignty, and creating a collective is the first step before you can have a, a, a GDPR that works uh, in the case of EU. So can we see an African Union come up with a common position uh, and in line with what you have just mentioned in terms of the research you've done? Yes, um, just to, to reiterate, the African Union came up with a common position in 2014, which was not an easy position because it was a process we started in 2012. Um, whereby uh, the first conversations were only among security people. So the importance of having these conversations open to everyone, including the common citizens and academic researchers, civil society, and other people um, to, have, to get into this conversation. And the, and the convention changed from only cyber security only to have a whole section on personal data protection. And uh, I'll just mention just one sentence. In one sentence, uh, Article 13 of the African Convention on Cyber Security and Personal Data Protection has various principles when it comes to what is lawful data processing, what is lawful within about data protection. And some of it is, for example, the first principle, consent, legitimacy, um, lawfulness, fairness, uh, purpose, the, the data connect collection processing must, be, must have a clear purpose, must be relevant, the storage must be uh, in a way that is accurate, confidential, and secure. Um, and and this position is uh, being replicated. Countries right now are trying to come up with cybersecurity, personal data protection, and electronic transaction laws. Uh, as I mentioned, only 23 countries have so far drafted or are in the process of coming up with, uh, with laws or with um, empowering the data protection authorities, but only nine have been fully successful. So 
we are headed there. We're not yet there, but we're headed there. But then just to point out, the GDPR is not perfect. Uh, that's something we, as Article 19, all the all, uh, globally, we have um, criticized some of the aspects. For example, uh, when uh, some of the content um, uh, removal process, procedures, content moderation procedures are not um, in a human rights friendly manner. So it's not perfect. So we as African um, um, side, if you look at the convention, the African convention is a bit different from the GDPR because um, we try to ensure that they, there is procedure, the content uh, removal um, moderation procedures uh, are in a, are as at par with the international best standards. So we're not perfect and we're not fo trying to follow any of the models. We're trying to come up with our own African narrative, just to insist that we are pushing for our own African narrative. And just to mention one thing, uh, two weeks ago we had a big win in Kenya, a uh, court case where we have been fighting for freedom of expression and privacy, where telcos were uh, instructed, just like in other parts of Africa, to install surveillance equipment in their systems and and we as article 19 and other partners went to court and these are among other 10 court cases which we've won over the last five years on this issue and you see um citizens care and that um uh we we went as i mentioned we we do what our users want what our community want and citizens wanted us to defend them on this and we are happy that the courts sided with us on this and some of those surveillance regulations were thrown out and we are working now with the government to come up with new, clear, human rights-friendly uh, regulations, not just in Kenya, but in Eastern Africa, the 14 countries that we work in. We have a hand here, and we have a, we have a couple of hands here. Can someone bring mics to the gentleman in the front? We'll uh, take another hand uh, to the back of the gentleman, then we'll come to this side. We'll take four questions, and then I'll come back to you. Can you make notes? We will take a, a bunch of questions. Good morning. My name is uh, Kamran Elahi, and I come from Silicon Valley. And as an American citizen, I think I can uh, uh, argue against a few m things that were mentioned. Uh, uh, first of all, as an extension of the Patriots Act, uh, uh, we found out that uh, all of our phone calls were listened to, all of our uh, text data, everything uh, was uh, being listened by the U.S. government, and uh, thanks to Edward Snowden, uh, this became uh, quite, a, uh, I guess, uh, he was a whistleblower that talked about that, and there is a reason that uh, he cannot come back to the United States. So we need to state the facts, and uh, if I remember correctly, under President Obama, he stopped some of these and said that uh, some of these were illegal, and the U.S. government should not be the big brother. Uh, how successful it has been, and especially under current condition that we have a president who says that uh, even some credentials of the press need to be revoked. Uh, I think that uh, we cannot ignore the role of government in uh, uh, being the big brother. And in terms of uh, private sector, I think it's important to make a distinction. If I post something about my trip to sci-fi, which I did, and uh, giving a lecture in uh, this conference, that is perfectly fine uh, to my uh, contacts because I post it as public. But I don't appreciate some either government or Facebook itself or LinkedIn take the list of say 27,000 contacts I have on LinkedIn, all of their data and sell it or provide it to a nefarious entity who uses the information about my friends to come and influence me and my friends and affect our elections. That is wrong. Thanks. So, uh, good question. I, I want some of your contacts on LinkedIn. Uh, 27,000. That's fantastic. Uh, can, we, can we go to the lady next to him, please? It's right there, right there. Let's just take those and then the lady behind Thank you. My name is Mariam Tendu Kamahai, and I come from uh, Senegal and Guinea in West Africa. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot of talk about what you said, but we didn't go a little bit further down. In, and, you, and when you speak about our own cultural uh, reality, having our own cultural narrative, I really appreciate what uh, Mr. Ephraim said. Um, the, the reality is that we ha also have our own um, cu cultural barriers when it comes to technology. And we want to talk about the African women, and we want to
want to talk about gender and that when we talk about the divide, not only when we're talking about countries of the, in the South, but we also have some issues with how we want to protect certain citizens, certain groups, vulnerable groups. So when you talk about cybersecurity, I'd love this conference to also go a little bit further down. As you come to Africa, we have these realities when we talk about sex trafficking, we talk about human trafficking, we talk about women working in the informal sector, not having access, not understanding what digital re revolution is all about or techno technological re revolution is all about. So all the problems we, we are talking about, it's a reality for 100% of the people. But then when you go down to the women, 50% of most of our countries, at least in West Africa, we're also talking about a specific group. The question now for you is that in your reflections, how do you see tackling the issue of gender divide? And we know that African women has a serious um, part to take in the, in the African development. Thank you. And this question I would like all of you to respond to because I think this is extremely important. Uh, minorities, gender, many of these communities are more prone to uh, political action if their privacy is compromised. And I think that's, uh, that's a proven established uh, fact. I, the, the lady there behind the third question. And finally, we'll go to the gentleman in the middle of the room. Yeah. Oh, right. hey, I, I, I couldn't. It's not, it's not a lady, but it's, uh, I think everybody will notice. Uh, you got it because I thought you were because of the light. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Now, would like to thank the, the speakers and maybe invite them to maybe I'll speak a little bit about the connectivity uh, solutions that already exist and some barriers need to be maybe, uh, maybe erased or at least lowered to allow maximum people to connect to internet. Um, one of these, I mean the gentleman in front of me, I mean, uh, spoke about Facebook privacy or data um, as partner here, we access partners here uh, as institutional partners and Facebook is our client. I don't know if we should take that offline or not about the privacy. He mentioned Facebook. It's not actually Facebook. It was uh, Cambridge Analytica. But I think that's another issue we can discuss later on in another forum on private. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's an offline conversation. Thank you for your intervention. Yeah, you. um, and finally, the last question. Uh, please bring the. Can I have the mic in the middle of the room here? In the next round, I'll come to the left corner. Uh, my observation is on... Yon, can you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Kiss Abraham. I'm coming from Zambia. Uh, my, my contribution and observation is on Sean's comments uh, regarding the need for uh, the user themselves to protect themselves and ensure their own privacy because they shouldn't uh, allow the companies and the governments to do that for them. Um, where I'm coming from, I think uh, more important than privacy is that people are more interested in access. Um, a good example of that is when you are, say, trying to access airport internet, you click the button that allows all your information to go to the airport and they get your data and everything. People are more interested in access. And I think that that's the reality. And I think in order for governments uh, to be held accountable, we need to put in place stronger mechanisms to ensure that governments and companies don't collect uh, data from users and use, use it in unlawful ways that, that can reduce people's capacity for... Can you give the mic to the gentleman behind you, the final intervention for this particular section? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for your measured and kind but brutal responses. My name is Malik. And I'm with the OCP Policy Center. And I wanted to ask you that, given how entrenched the misuse of personal information has become in our societies, what do you think are some concrete steps that we can all take to revert this? Um, perhaps Ms. Berger can speak to us about the European General Data Protection Regulation that is coming into force. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, can you just repeat the last sentence and uh, uh, hold the mic close to your mouth? Yeah. Maybe Ms. Berger can speak to us about the uh, upcoming general data protection regulation that is coming into force uh, in the US. So how is it going to respond to the m widespread misuse of personal data? How is GDPR going to be the silver bullet that will save the entire world? Kathleen will explain to us now. Kathleen, we'll begin with you and we'll go down the road. Nice, you always put the questions really... Uh, Easily. Um, 
I'm still going to start like with just commenting on the things that I heard. Um, you from Silicon Valley, I, I didn't catch your name, I just heard you were, <laughs> right, Cameron. Um, I think you, you pointed to a very important element as in you choose what you want to share and exactly that choice needs to change and that kind of links to something that Sean mentioned earlier as in legal protections are not going to save the world and that also sort of addresses GDPR. GDPR is a great step forward and because of the fine mechanism, it gives enforcement teeth because it's going to be very costly for companies not to comply. And also, it, it's not only for companies that are based in the European Union, but it applies to any resident within the EU. So any company that does service with the European Union has to comply, which also makes it rather costly to adopt different standards um, for different constituencies. Um, so I'm actually counting on the ripple effects of the GDPR, and I know that India is already working on its way, and, and Ephraim mentioned that also. It's not perfect. It's a 100-page document. I don't think we're expecting anyone to get there. It also took six years to actually get it implemented, so it's definitely not a perfect process, but it's getting us there. On the practical issue, companies have to step up their game, and I mean it when I say we need to start thinking in the long-term profit and forget about, like, short-term profit is not going to make a change, but system change requires all actors to get together, and for the uh, vulnerable communities, and especially the gender divide, I think that is part of that also, because the system is not going to change and it's going to continue to oppress and exploit those that are already vulnerable because of those divides. Like existing divides that we have in the offline world are just being amplified. And if we want that to change, then all stakeholders need to come together and we need to find ways in which we make sure that people who don't know how to protect themselves offline don't even get exploited further in the online world. I think that is a very tough challenge and I'm super curious to learn more about that and I'm very glad that this conversation, especially from cultural narratives, is happening here also. Um, what was the other thing? Shouldn't the government uh, also protect the users and more important than privacy is access? Obviously access is critically important in order to actually reap the benefits of the digital society, but I think if we're Again, short term, long term, we want everyone to have access to in order to enrich their lives, but you also need to make sure that you still have a space where you can be yourself. So it is also up to the governments to make sure that your rights are protected and that the companies adhere to the law that exists in order to make sure that once you come online or even before you come online, your rights are already being sold out. I think that's a very dangerous um, precedent. Sean, I would like you also to respond to the implied question uh, in the gentleman's question um, case. He asked that uh, you're actually preying on the vulnerable. As they seek access, you are actually compromising their personal space. And in that sense, uh, how do you uh, now think about practical measures to prevent this from happening? Okay, thank you for all the questions. I, I will try to address them in the order they received. Uh, to my fellow citizen Cameron from the United States, I must respectfully correct you on the first uh, articulation of what you said. You said we, it was revealed that we were all being listened to by the U.S. government. In my opening comments, I made a very clear distinction between listening to content or looking at the connectivity data. This telephone number called that telephone number, this email, e that email, that email address, but without the content. You are correct that under the Section 702 program and others and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that in certain instances with a court warrant, content is listened to, but that is on a per-person, court-authorized basis, and that is true in many governments and countries, and I would offer in Europe the standards for getting that kind of surveillance is actually much lower than in the United States. What you refer to as the ubiquitous listening is actually not the ubiquitous listening, it's the ubiquitous connectivity data, and we can debate the merits, the, the strengths, and the shortfalls of that, but that is actually what is being universally collected and those programs under the Patriot Act have been continued. Uh, so while I respectfully disagree with you on that aspect, uh, I would invite you to... Uh, I have seen that movie and I actually speak from a position of knowledge having been very well informed about those programs and what was actually happening, so I will respectfully agree to disagree with you, sir. Uh, I would invite you to look at the latest ODNI statistical transparency report. It's a great document, and it actually identifies what they have been looking at for the last year. It, you may or may not believe it, but it's an interesting resource you may be interested in. Just came out. Uh, I do, however, greatly agree with you on your concern about the private sector possibly revealing more than you are interested to or merchandising your data. Uh, I've 
personally do not like multiple user agreements with certain entities, and I choose to not do business with those social media platforms. I simply don't use certain platforms who would use my data in ways that I do not want to authorize them to. Then, of course, we have the example of Cambridge Analytica, where even Facebook has acknowledged that the activity conducted violated its own principles, and then we're into an ex post event, uh, punitive measures, how do you remediate it? As Kathleen says, GDPR is about putting teeth on enforcement. It helps s solve the problem after the fact and deter future instances. I hope what we've learned and what Facebook has learned from Cambridge Analytica will help uh, prevent similar things in the future. But that's why I talk about practical security rather than political or legal security. The rest of my comments are going to be quick, but they follow from this broader discussion. Gender and privacy and tech think it's absolutely important everywhere in the world, possibly more acutely in certain societies, Africa and elsewhere, but I think it's important globally. And identity is a huge challenge because you want it and you don't want it. You don't want it when it would lead to persecution of female or other gender or minority ethnicities or religions. You do want it when you want truth of voice, for example, in the US elections. We complain that without identity, our democracy was violated. I can also refer to some very unfortunate examples where in the Arab Spring or in the Syrian conflict, certain voices that were claiming to be local and of the people. I'm thinking about a specific case where a user claimed to be a Syrian lesbian suffering human rights violations. It actually unfortunately turned out to be a US white male just having fun on the internet. That's a case where I would want to know the identity of the voice to know who I'm supporting and if they are legitimate. So it's a double-edged sword, ma'am, and I don't have a perfect solution for it. The gentleman talked about collectivity and maximum connectivity. I think that's incredibly important for bringing the world online. And while I don't represent any company, I know there are certain companies that are starting to put uh, balloon-held hotspots around the world, trying to get connectivity to more places. I favor getting everyone online. Uh, the need, the ability to protect yourselves, another gentleman asked. I think we need accountability and transparency of governments more and more, including my own and including every other one represented. Unless you know what they're doing, you can't protect your rights. And that brings me to the last comment about recommendations. Vis-a-vis -vis companies, I recommend every single one of you read the user agreements and start mobilizing for user agreements that you find more acceptable and let the marketplace deliver the product that you want demand-driven products, not supply-side-driven products. And of course, vis-a-vis -vis your governments, demand the right to use technologies that protect your privacy. Don't leave it in the hands of a bureaucrat or a US corporate entity. Demand technology that you can use to protect yourself and demand it to be legal in your country. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh Again, I would like to reclaim the space. The conversation is happening on the stage, not on the side of the room. Uh, it's distracting when you're speaking and, and the, 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 the panelists are responding. Uh, Percy. So I'll start with uh, the question about gender from Mariam. Uh, just to acknowledge that uh, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, 43% of uh, co connectivity, for, it's less by, uh, on, on the women's side and girls' side, it's 43%. So we need to do more. Uh, less, uh, less women are connected, so the, the divides that happen offline are now translating online. We need to, to establish uh, more partnerships to, uh, to uh, ensure that more women get connected. And just, just to go back to the research that Article 19 did with women uh, journalists, uh, where we found women journalists were withdrawing from online, those who are online are going back offline because of their privacy rights being infringed. So there is that going now to the next question about the nexus between access and privacy. When people come online and then you discover, oh, Cambridge Analytica came and did work in Kenya, and this is what happened. I was getting texts, being invited to go and vote at a specific polling station that I vote, that you have triangulated all that, my bio data from uh, the uh, election register, from the telco register, and you have all this data mapped out and you are sending me a specific message. Uh, that make some people get scared. I know some people right now who don't want to go back online uh, after the Cambridge Analytica work that happened in Kenya, and this is now public knowledge. Uh, we even had a conversation with Facebook two weeks ago in Kenya. Uh, they came to Kenya and they met um, 
uh, uh, the public and talked about it. Um, so the issue of access. We need to work more to ensure that um, spectrum policy uh, is more open to uh, new forms of connectivity. Uh, so uh, this, in a way, building human rights by design onto spectrum policy conversation, such that when you are a company, and I'm not going to mention the names of the companies, but some of the companies who uh, are uh, having balloons in the air in Kenya, in uh, somewhere in Central Africa, among other places, Southern Africa, working to connect people, trying to make sure that when you're doing that, don't collect the data that is not necessary. So building privacy by design, such that, uh, on human rights by design, such that you don't block certain content, uh, you don't infringe on their human, on their freedom of expression and information, wh or uh, when they are connecting using your services. And then uh, the, the last bit about uh, connectivity in an African design. Right now, we're coming up with an African uh, con continental free trade agreement. I'm sure you've, some of you have had some of the governments here, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, and others have signed on to this. So we are getting there as an African. We're coming up with an African narrative as Africans. So we are getting there. We're not yet there, but just as Kathleen mentioned about the European experience, uh, Europe took several years to get where they are. Um, we are also getting there. We're taking those baby steps together. شكرا لكم سيد الرئيس ما أود أن أثير انتباه الحضور الكريم هو أن في المغرب وسائل الاتصال هي متاحة للجميع وبصبيب عالي جدا ولمختلف الشرائح العمرية وأكاد أجزم جوابا على سؤال أستاذ أكاد أجزم أن نسبة الإناث التي تستعمل وسائل اتصال وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي هي أكثر من نسبة الرجال كما أن المرأة في المغرب تتبوأ مراتب عليا سواء في الوزارة أو في القضاء أو في البرلمان أو في جميع جميع الإدارات أضف إلى ذلك أن المغرب مؤخرا قد فتح المجال للمرأة لولوج عالم كان منذ قرون محصورا على الرجال خاصة في الدول الإسلامية وهو مجال خطة العدالة بحيث أصبح من بإمكان المرأة المغربية أن تصبح عدلا وقد أنجزنا في وزارة العدل بصفة مدير للمورد البشرية فقد أجرينا اختبارات الكتابية ونحن بصدد التهيئ للامتحانات الشفوية قصد تخريج أول فوج من النساء العادلات وهذه تعتبر ثورة في دولة إسلامية بقيادة صاحب الجلالة نصر الله ما أود إثارته كذلك هو أن في هذا اللقاء نتحدث على المعطيات الشخصية وإحاتاحة الفرصة للجميع قصد تبادل المعلومات في مكان آمن بالنسبة لنا في وزارة العدل أود أن أسوق تجربة قد تكون في صميم هذا الموضوع وهو هاجس تخوف الذي يمتلك المتعاملين مع هذه الوسائل ومع المنصات الإلكترونية فوزارة العدل قطعت أشواطا كبيرة في هذا المجال أسوق مثالا بسيطا هو أنه قد تم إحداث منصة إلكترونية آمنة بآمنة جدا وقد تواصلنا مع السادة المحامون لحثهم وتعريفهم بهذه المنصة والتي بإمكان المحامي أن يلج إليها وأن يسجل مقاله وأن يؤدي الرسوم القضائية وأن يتلقى المذكرات الجوابية وأن يرافع من خلالها 
وأن يحصر الملف للمداولة وأن يحصل على حكمه من خلال مكتبه دون أن ينتقل إلى المحكمة ومع ذلك وبالرغم من كوننا نتعامل مع نخبة من السادة المحامون وهم نخبة في المجتمع ومع ذلك فإن هذه الفكرة تلقى اعتراضا كبيرا من مجموعة كبيرة من السادة المحامون وإلى حدود الساعة وقد انطلقت التجربة منذ شهور لم نسجل إلا ملفين أو ثلاث ملفات من خلال هذه المنصة هذا دليل بالنسبة لي دليل قاطع ويجيب إجابة شافية على مدى التخوف الذي يمتلك الشخص المثقف وبأحرى بالنسبة للمواطن العادي والبسيط نفس الشيء بالنسبة لنخبة أخرى من المتعاملين مع المحاكم وهي نخبة الموثقون ونخبة الخبراء الحيسوبيون فتعلمون جميعا أن وزارة العدل تؤدي مجموعة من الخدمات الإلكترونية عبر الخط دون الولوج إلى المحكمة كذا بالنسبة مثلا لإجراء السجل التجاري وإنشاء المقاولة وبالنسبة لوضع القوائم التركيبية السنوية بالنسبة للشركات ومع ذلك فإن الموثق أو المحاسب يفضل اللجوء إلى المحكمة وإيداع أوراقه والأداء شخصيا دون اللجوء إلى هذه المنصة هذا بالرغم من كون المغرب كما قلت يملك ترسانة قانونية قوية من خلال القانون الذي تحدثت عنه قبل قليل والذي بدأ العمل به منذ سنة 2009 شكرا سيد الرئيس Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, now a bunch of questions from this side. I'll we'll take, this is the last round. Uh, okay, we'll take four questions. We'll start with the lady there. Can we get the mic to the lady there? Uh, and to the gentleman behind her after that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amina Khairi. I'm a journalist from um, Egypt, from Cairo. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first question is for Sean. Um, I just want to uh, make it clear because I didn't understand the comment that you made. There's, there was this recommendation or advice that you made for people in the um, Arab region, in India and Africa. Uh, what I understood is that you said uh, in order to preserve the cultural identity, we have to rely on technologies of our own. Um, I mean, were you being sarcastic? I mean, of course, you know that technologies did not originate or would not created in this part of the world. We have to rely on Silicon Valley for technology. This is my question. Maybe I, under I misunderstood. Um, the other question, I think there is a dilemma maybe on the um, human rights side of the, of the of thinking. Um, I mean, you, all of us, we are requiring maximum connectivity for everybody. But when we offer maximum connectivity to certain individuals or groups or organizations, such as ISIS, for example, or others, um, we decide to deprive them of all connectivity. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Um, how can we deal with this? Thank you. Uh, let me add to that, uh, and for Kathleen, there is also an assertion in many quarters that your, your obsession with privacy and personal uh, space has led to your inability to crack down on certain subversive elements that have mushroomed in Europe. There is a real fear around that. Uh, the gentleman behind, please. The mic there, please. To the gentleman there. I am Isaac Mokama. I come from Uganda, ICT for Development. Uh, my, my question seems to go to the uh, Human Resource Manager, Minister of Justice, and my my fellow East African from, from uh, I, I, I seem to perceive that Africa's problem is not policy. Africa seems to import policy from China, from the US, from Europe. We seem to copy a lot of things from everywhere. And yet the justice system seems to be extremely slow at implementing the policy. We've had cases in Uganda where Judges needed interpreters on what had happened. We had someone's account hacked, and the judge needed someone to help them understand exactly what had happened. 
Don't you think Africa's problem is not just policy? It seems to be something else. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there are two hands here, please, on this side of the aisle. Yeah. We'll come to these two gentlemen here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Madalit Sopiri. I'm based in South Africa. Um, I, I have two questions, but I'll make them quick. The first one has to do, I, I, I feel like the, the concept of our discussion here is... Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay, on, on managing disruption. Uh, managing disruption as opposed to actually asking the difficult questions about how the state itself can be a source of insecurity. And it's being ossified. I think what we have seen, like uh, the players. Can we have the questions? I, I need to move very quickly. So okay, please pose so, the questions to specific yeah, so, people. So uh, this question can be answered by anyone. So w what is the role of uh, new actors in a, in a time where the state has, or technology is changing the identity of what is traditionally understood as a state. Okay. The state is, is very different today. What is the role of new actors to fill the void? Uh, the gentleman behind, please. Kamal Dahshan, professor of computer science from Egypt. In fact, between the people of openness and the people of privacy, there is a gray area, and everything is being played on this gray area. That's why people disagree with each other. It's not only a matter of law, it is also a matter of ethics. Ethics plays a major role. How to transform ethics to laws? And ethics are, are not the same all over the world. What is convenient in the West is not necessarily our ethics. This may be different from one continent. The question, to please, we, we, I'm running the out question, of time. The it's question is how to transform local ethics into laws. Thank you. So how can policy be culturally contextual? Okay. Uh, we will come to the gentleman in the front, last intervention. The mic here, please. I'm run, I've run out of time. I'll have to end with it. Then, of course, we'll have uh, plenty of time during the day to have these conversations offline. Sean is going to be here for two days. You can catch him later as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, the question is for Sean, and rightfully got most of the attacks, but we forgive you. But <laughs> the question is, you have spoken about that is not going to be Big Brother, and then yet right away you spoke about the new generation and not really clinging into privacy the same way we all generation uh, clinge into it or explain it or want it. Are you inserting the idea to the young generation or do you have data that tells you that the young generation doesn't want or doesn't have the same values of us for private, uh, for their private information and so on? So it brings me back to the question of who, who comes first, the egg or the chicken or the hen? Or does the media form the public opinion or the public opinion forms the media? And in your case, okay. are you going to insert the idea or do you... So Sean, are you manipulating all of us into believing that privacy is not important? That's the question he's asking. Okay, so uh, uh, I think with the, that's it. Uh, we are done for the questions. I'm going to give you all a minute each and you can choose the question you want to answer. If you don't answer some questions, I will apologize on your behalf. So go ahead, one minute each. Yeah, you start, Catherine. Yeah. I'm trying to start. Um, the question around does privacy protect criminals in, or criminal elements, terrorists, etc. cetera. Um, I think that's a false dichotomy as such because there, obviously we're all trying to make sure that terrorism isn't taking over the world. I don't think there's any disagreement on that and we want to make sure that just as in the offline world we have societal problems that we need to deal with in the online world that remains safe and welcoming to everyone and we don't want anyone to be silenced because they're criminal elements or manipulators or terrorists online that use that environment for their own purposes and to spread their messaging. 
obviously that's something we need to take care of. I don't think that privacy is an obstacle to making that happen. Um, it's just a matter of how you actually infringe on that. So I'm just going to tackle that one question because it was directly addressed to me. In the interest of time, I will also only speak to the two that were directly engaged to me. To the Egyptian journalist, ma'am, I would never disrespect you in this kind of a forum by being sarcastic about issues so important. I truly believe that new technology solutions can come out of developing countries to meet their own cultural needs and political desires. I simply need to point to China that has created Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, companies that are certainly derivative or resemble American companies but have the Chinese character that that nation seeks. I see wonderful students attending US PhD programs at Caltech, MIT, working in Silicon Valley and going back to other countries around the world to develop startups in those countries. I also see wonderful educational programs starting in Bahrain and for one example where I've recently been at work and other countries. So I absolutely believe that there can be technology solutions coming from other countries so that the world is not exclusively dependent on Silicon Valley and Shenzhen. There should be a range of options and you should be able to pick what serves your interests. Uh, and on denied connectivity, functionality and security are always a trade-off and it's about finding the right balance for your society. That actually becomes a political question. Okay, and to the gentleman in the front row, uh, I truly believe that the state itself is not the driving factor of big data analysis and the big brother concept. The distinction, you pointed out what was seemingly possibly an inconsonance between two things I said. In fact, they're not because t looking at the youth, they are voluntarily, in a legal sense, giving up that privacy through the user agreements. Now, I do not profess to speak on behalf of the youth who are 20 years younger than me, but you ask if I have data. I have data from all of them who are choosing to participate in Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and a range of other things instead of demanding a different product. Now, when, when we look at some of the CEOs of those companies, they are 15, 20 years younger than me. They are from a different generation, yet they are still creating this model and this construct. I hope and I encourage them, the youth, to make their own future. Don't relive my life. Don't relive my grandfather's life. Define the technology you want to use in your life and create it. Back to what I was speaking to the lady. Thank you very much. Yes, just uh, to mention I'm a young person and uh, I want privacy. Uh, this is something I just want to point out that um, when you mention about it being designed in that manner, it's, uh, it's a bit of a false, um, false presumption that the youth don't want privacy. Just to, to, to re-emphasize, there's a number of research which shows that young people want privacy. Young people all over the world uh, want privacy. So, <laughs> yes, basically they're, they're quite ignorant of what what, what it is, and, and so just to answer questions, and then also just on that point, if we put the, um, the responsibility on the individual, it, it is like putting the responsibility of uh, protecting um, clean air on the individual. It should be a public responsibility. Privacy should be a public responsibility. We shouldn't put it on the individual to protect yourself. Uh, air quality control shouldn't be a, an individual responsibility. Um, so uh, the question on privacy, openness versus privacy, uh, issue of ethics, building, making sure that policy are culturally, uh, yes, culturally context, contextual. I'll mention the various principles that various people have come up with, 13 principles on necessity and proportionality, which are agreed all over. The, the Afri I've mentioned about the African Union coming up with uh, the convention, and there are various principles which relate to the, Kenya, uh, to the African uh, not, uh, culture, not just one um, import from one place. As I mentioned, there are differences between those principles and the GDPR. Uh, so we are building um, policies uh, in a way that they're culturally contextual. And then the question about, uh, from the East African, about that was directed to me, Africa's problem, policy, what is the African problem beyond policy? I'll say there's so many policies that are in place or so many laws that we've signed on to international, but then we don't have the capacity to, to implement because of the knowledge gap. Some of the uh, lawyers, some of the judges that we deal with, um, or some of the people that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are at a different generational uh, gap, and we have to translate this 
te technological issues to a way that they are able to understand. So that's the big challenge, for example, in the Uganda case, the law case that you're, uh, law court case that you're talking about that I'm very aware, aware about. So uh, some of the challenges that we are facing uh, are that age generational gap capacity building. Thank you. Pod. Okay, good. So um, uh, can I, uh, before we close this panel, we have the last intervention for this morning. Um, and after that, we have earned our lunch. Uh, uh, it's been a very rich um, discussion, but let me invite uh, Ambassador Sanjay Verma, Additional Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, to deliver his uh, keynote address. Uh, and uh, this will be the last intervention for this morning. After his address, uh, Beda will come and make a few housekeeping announcements. You guys will sit on stage, and we will applaud all of you together. <laughs> Thank you so many uh, panelists, friends, ladies and gentlemen. When I look at the topic, it says technology, innovation, society. Technology, what kind of technology? We discussed a lot about Silicon Valley. We discussed big corporates. But technology that we need in a developing world has to be appropriate. It has to be affordable. When I look at the next word in the theme, which is innovation, what kind of innovation? How can innovation be encouraged? How can regulation encourage the innovation? Generally, regulations are taken in a negative sense, but regulations are, have to be there in order to encourage innovation. Society, it has to be digitally inclusive. Digitally, because we are talking about the digital domain, but otherwise, society has to be inclusive. Any solution which is to be found has to include everyone without discriminating on the gender, the riches, or the awareness. With that, let me now start uh, on the topic which I have been given, which is basically India-Africa Digital Partnership. And here I would like to emphasize the word partnership. We are not prescribing. We are just sharing best practices that we have, which may not be the best practices the world has seen. We are a partner to Africa, and that thought had come long, long back. When we look at ICT partnership, it started way back in 2005, when Pan-African e-network was uh, uh, conceptualized, and that was to be implemented in all the 54 countries in Africa. Today, I'm glad to tell you that there are 47 countries which are already participating in it. What is it all about? It is about creating telemedicine access. It is about VOIP. It is about education. It is about metrological services and the uh, e-governance, e-commerce. So the list goes on. When I look at education, there are about 30,000 new students in Africa who have been provided with degrees, certificates, and diplomas through these courses which are conducted remotely through e-network uh, uh, e uh, project. The entire project, the cost of the entire project, the concept of the entire project, the management of the entire project was initially borne by the government of India. But do we want to own this project for all the time? No. Infrastructure, yes. So basically, we come to the next stage, which is the capacity development. We have to build capacity in our friends in Africa so that they can manage their own affairs, so that they can manage this network and then feel empowered and enriched through this particular uh, initiative taken by the government of India. Digital divide is being breached through this. When we talk of capacity building, we also have other programs in tow. They are known as ITEC scholarship program, that is Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation schemes. There are programs through which the African friends can go to India and study, that is ICCR scholarship. There are CV Raman scholarship, particularly in the field of agriculture, but that also includes cyber technologies and tools of uh, digital world uh, included in it. We rather prefer to train master trainers who can come back and train other trainees in their own language 
and the cultural ecosystem. So therefore, that, that had been India's partnership with Africa in the past. What is it that we are looking at the future? Because future is what is being discussed here. Whether it is privacy issue, whether it's the issue of securing the cyberspace. I'm not saying cybersecurity, because to us, to citizens, securing the cyberspace is much more important than just one vertical, which is cybersecurity. Transfer of best, best practices. How do we initiate a conversation, a dialogue with Africa to see what best practices should be shared? As far as we are concerned from the point of view and perspective of India, we are ready to share it all. We are creating centers of excellence in Africa. One has recently been set up in Morocco as well uh, in the information technology domain. We have uh, uh, various other countries which are recipient of uh, such centers of excellence. We are keen to support it all the way that it takes. We are keen to develop the, the capacity in our African friends to take it further. The Digital India has led us to believe that inclusive societies are extremely important for governance. The tools, the capacity building that we are mentioning are all in order to make everyone included in the digital economy and digital society. We have seen the increase, increased participation by those who are benefiting through digital access. Unless people participate, government cannot hear all the voices. So it is very important to have access provided in the previous session. Someone talked about the access. Without access, we cannot dream of a digital world. We cannot dream of digital inclusiveness. Therefore, what we are doing in India, we are trying to roll out as much fiber, net, fiber optic network as possible by 2020. In fact, we have a dream that we will connect each household in India through fiber optic by 2022. If that dream comes true, we are working towards that then probably we will be the first country in the world to have done that. And that too, without any discrimination. So that is going through the government network. Private players are participating in that and they are strengthening the government's hand in reaching to the next, to the last person on the Indian soil. While we were take, trying to roll out the social inclusiveness through digital media and digital tools, what we realized that we do not have a mean to identify people. Very strange. A country, a civilization which is so old did not have a national or doesn't have a national identity card. So we did not really know how to reach a person, where to reach that person. That is what led to the development of biometrics based identity. We call it Aadhaar, but it is biometric-based identity. It is on the uh, uh, fingerprints as well as on iris. The data has to be kept secured, as we, as we heard. Uh, uh, the data remains with the government, and we maintain a type of uh, uh, security uh, which is able to secure the data to the threats of the present day's uh, technological tools. Tomorrow, the threat will increase. And then, then the government will have to reinvent itself and see that those data are secured again. So it's a, it's a dynamic ecosystem. We cannot say that today data is secure, so tomorrow also the data will remain secured. And therefore, it needs a lot of innovation, a lot, lot of technological capacity building in order to keep us going and keep the data safe and secured uh, for each and every citizen of India. While we identified our people, Thereafter, we looked at their demands, which came through the demographic analysis of the data, and services reached there. What was the main problem in India? It's a huge country. The government is very small as compared to most of the governments. Uh, if you look at the per capita uh, government servant, per capita people government servant, it's very, very small. In a, even if in a capital city of India, 
uh, uh, you have uh, one police officer every 10,000 persons. So it, it is a very small uh, a government, though the numbers will be large because the number, the population itself is huge. So how do we reach to the last person on in, in India for the service delivery purpose? This has helped us. Now, do they have laptops? Do they have tablets? Because yesterday evening there was a conversation on laptops. They don't have. Then how do we reach them as a government? How do they reach us as citizens? They reach us through an $8 mobile phone. This $8 mobile phone is able to deliver the services that they require. This $8 mobile phone is able to upload their demands to the government so that the government can come back to them again through the digital mode and help them out. It has been able to sort out the problem of leakage. Wherever you have middlemen, there will be leakage. So there was a, a series of uh, a hierarchy of middlemen who were responsible for huge leakages from the service delivery mechanism by the government in India. It has also led to banking the unbanked. It was extremely important for India because the benefits were supposed to be transferred to them. That has also happened, and I'm talking about last two years, when you have seen all these developments coming through. So it's not difficult. We are there. Our friends in Africa has been asking us as to if the similar model or same model could be implemented in their countries. We say we have the model. Tell us your requirements. We'll come, help you out, and the cost will be borne on the government of India. So we are not coming to you with commerce. We are not coming to you to take your resources away. We are just coming to you because we were there where some of the African countries are now. We went through the same path. We want whatever we have learned through going uh, through the same path can be shared with you. And then you can choose. Options have to be there. So then the communities, the countries can choose what is it that they actually want from us and we'll be ready to share that with you. In cyberspace, all countries are equal. In fact, the weakest link in the cyberspace is the most vulnerable space within subspace within the cyberspace. A group of 20 people can bring down a country, elected government. It can bring down a banking service. So therefore, earlier we were talking about geographies, big countries, big, big armies, big, big militaries able to invade and therefore defeat. Today you're talking about a group of 50, 100 people who can bring down the whole system. Therefore, the weakest link is the most vulnerable link. Can we bring capacities in those weakest links so that I am secured? Cyberspace doesn't know any boundaries or limits. So if someone wishes to launch an attack from an island which has no population, no rule of law, it is equally dangerous to all of us, whether it is the largest cyber country or the poorest cyber country. So therefore, it is very important that we keep talking on how to secure the cyber space, how to secure the world through cyber technologies. They will be, uh, uh, and this is a responsibility for everyone, not only the government. Government is just one of the stakeholders. It is a process which has, been do, which has to be driven through multi-stakeholding approach. Government knows governance. Government may not know technology. Government may not know the innovation of technologies that you do. Government may not know the incremental development that you do in the technology. So everyone has to come on a platform including judiciaries, uh, uh, including the financial uh, companies, health service providers, everyone has to come on it. And then the multi-stakeholding approach can move forward to secure all of us. Though I'm talking in, uh, uh, as a government servant, but I'm also a citizen. I also need myself to be secured. And therefore, all of us have to come together in this. What we are doing in Africa in this regard is that we are having our computer emergency response team, CERT, 
to collaborate with similar computer emergency response teams in Africa. Those countries which still do not have a CERT, we are trying to help them creating one. We, with Morocco, uh, we, are, we have already finalized the text, uh, with the permission of the ambassador, if I can say that, uh, we have already finalized the text which is going to be signed fairly soon. Uh, and that will be a cert to cert uh, uh, cooperation agreement. Uh, we have a friend from Egypt, uh, uh, a team from Egypt was in India seven days back for STQC related activities, which is basically norms and standardization of equipment, not, not norms of state behavior. Cybercrime was mentioned time and again. It's a huge challenge. And cybercrime doesn't only include uh, uh, the, the financial cybercrime. To me, it also includes the terrorism which is perpetrated through cyber, uh, cyber tools. Therefore, for all of us to live in peace and dignity, it is very important that we cooperate on cybercrime. We have a globally acceptable framework through which we can control our own lives and defend ourselves from any type of cybercrime emanating from the cyber tools. A lot of discussions are going on on all these topics globally. Uh, we are a developing country. We can understand the concerns of a developing country. We are members of almost all these committees and subcommittees on cyber space uh, related issues all over the world. Uh, please tell us if you have any concern which we can hear on your behalf in such international conversations and discussions. We'll be very happy to do so. Uh, and finally, where, what we can do further is through very affordable cyber tools, can we look at providing a better price to our farmers? Can we tell him what is, whether tomorrow it is going to rain or not? Very simple things. I'm not talking about uh, uh, extremely technologically savvy tools. These are very, very simple things but this can change the lives of our people. And they are, it is because of them that we are there, it is because of them that the big corporates are there. Unless they reach to the last man on the earth, last woman on the earth, it will not be possible for them to grow all the time. We can also look at various bilateral mechanisms with individual African countries as well as we can look at various multilateral engagements, including one with the African Union, to take it forward and share our best practices with them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I wanted to talk about from India's perspective and how are we cooperating with Africa. But this is only limited by 15 minutes which Samir had given to me. Uh, but anything more that you want to learn or tell me, please do so, so that I can take home some of the suggestions which you have. Thank you very much once again. Please also um, join me in um, thanking the panel who was um, extremely engaging on the critical question of privacy and personal data. All of them are also available. Let me invite Beda to tell us what we do next over the next two hours. Beda, please take the mic and show us the way. Uh, thank you, uh, Sameer. Uh, we'll now move into our uh, lunch. Uh, lunch is being served here on your right is the Jet Set Room and in Firdos, which is one level above. I just wanted to highlight also that while the conversations here are trilingual, uh, the conversations over the lunch session and Firdos and Jet Set will only be in English. Um, you will now move to those rooms. Lunch will be served as you enter. Um, and uh, the panels will begin half an hour after, you, after the people have gathered in the rooms. That is all. Thank you.